Hello everybody, welcome to video number 21 in my Richard Lehman horror novel review series. Today I am talking about Dark Mountain from 1987. The cover art on this by Steve Crisp is some of my very favourite cover art, not just in a, a Lehman book but on any novel in my horror collection because it reminds me a lot of a lake that I used to go to when I was a kid near where I grew up and I'm talking about how these mountains here, they're, they're almost like a curtains which draw back to let the sun in and that was exactly what it looked like in the lake I'm talking about and I did in fact camp there when I was uh, sometimes there was no creepy little uh, dilapidated cross in the ground but other than that it's pretty similar to what I knew so I really love that cover art by Steve Crisp the spine here this is one of Lehman's uh, medium length books at 370 pages here's the back it says two families join forces for a camping holiday high in the California mountains it's meant to be fun. A break from city life, a healthy interlude in the hills amid the wonders of nature. If only they hadn't pitched camp at Mesquite Lake, home to two of the wilderness's most terrifying inhabitants, an aged hag whose loyalty to the evil one gives her gruesome powers, and her son, a depraved half-beast whose unnatural lusts even she cannot control. All right, so uh, back a couple of months ago when I reviewed a layman book called No Sanctuary, uh, I had said that... Um, uh, that book, No Sanctuary, is partially set in the woods and involves camping. And I had said that Lehman has a much better book involving camping set in the woods. And this is the one that I was talking about, Dark Mountain. So this was written in 1987, right at the beginning of Lehman's golden era. I think that 1987 to 1994 or 5 was his classic period. And this was the first book in that run. <clears throat> And let me start by saying that uh, this is a little bit unusual for a Lehman book in that it's divided into parts. Oh, it's very unusual for a Lehman book because it begins with a poem that he wrote. Uh, <clears throat> and that also reminds me, Tread Softly. This book was originally published under the title Tread Softly, and it was one of two novels Lehman published under the pseudonym of Richard Kelly. And I've never been able to figure out why he decided to do that. This one and Midnight's Lair were published under the pseudonym of Richard Kelly. Kelly is his daughter's name. So I maybe he felt that these were more personal to his daughter because they, they do both involve teenage uh, girls prominently. But uh, other than that, they're typical laymen and they're full of the same usual sex and violence that I don't know a father would really want to dedicate to his daughter. But for whatever reason, this was originally published as Tread Softly by Richard Kelly. Opens with a poem, like I said, and uh, my, the point I was making is that this book is divided into parts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Part one, part two, and part three. And then he gets more into the more usual chapter system. I uh, can't think of many books where he did that. Island comes to mind, I think, Endless Night. But generally, it's a rare thing for him to do. But it's a very good idea here because these are very distinct parts. Going into this book, when I first read it, I thought that this entire thing was going to be set in the woods. And I'll be honest, about 150 pages in, I started to wish that wasn't the case because it does get ever so slightly tedious because Lehman isn't known for his description. And if you are going to set an entire book in the woods, it is important to put the reader in those woods, you know, and describe the atmosphere and everything that's there. And uh, and that's not what Lehman really does. He's all about action and stuff like that. But I'm very happy to say that they don't spend all their time in the woods. Part one involves them camping and confronting this woman and her son. Part two puts them back in L.A. And part three has them going back to the woods for a confrontation with this uh, final confrontation with the woman. So let, <clears throat> let me get into the characters then. Now this is um, this involves two families, like it said on the back. The first family is a guy called Scott and his new girlfriend, Karen, and Scott's two children, 16-year-old Julie and 12-year-old Benny. The other family is a guy called Arnold and his wife, Alice, their 17-year-old son, Nick, and two 10-year-old twin girls. Uh, I think they were called Heather and Rose. They're, they're very minor characters, those two twins, necessarily, because they're so young. They don't have an awful lot to say or do. But uh, so there are nine characters in total. And the best, best thing that I can say about this book is that it's the characterization is really good. In my last few reviews of Layman books, um, 
After Midnight, Buddy Rides, Quake. I really criticize the characterization, but I can't do that here because they're really likable people. Even the teenagers and the adolescents, usually in a layman book, what you're getting with teenagers and adolescents is walking hormones, just sex crazed <clears throat> kids who can really do and think of nothing other than having sex. And that's really not the case here. Um, 12 year old Benny is extremely likable kid. He's, he's funny. He's resourceful. He's intelligent. He's observant. Nick, the 17 year old boy. Again, you, you think 17 year old boy in a layman book, you tend to know what you get in there, but here it's not that he's considerate. He's kind. He's thoughtful. He's intelligent. He's, he behaves like a normal, intelligent 17 year old boy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the 16 year old girl, um, Julie, obviously Julie and Nick end up falling in love with each other. But um, Julie is presented at the beginning as kind of a brat, but she's got a reason to be that way because she's just lost her mother and this new woman, Karen, has arrived on the scene and muscled her way. Well, she thinks muscled her way into her father's affections. Karen, though, is extremely nice person, and I'm going to use this word again and again, likable. Everyone other than possibly Alice, the wife of uh, Arnold, she's a bit annoying, but she's meant to be. She's the archetypal stick in the mud who always seems to be along on these kinds of trips that families go on. The downer, you know, she puts a damper on all, everyone's good mood. But she's not that obtrusive, she's just kind of a background character who comes along every now and again to chastise somebody. <clears throat> Didn't mind her. <clears throat> I'm sorry about my throat, I'm a bit ill. Uh, there's only one minor flaw that I can find in the characterization here. It, it does involve Karen. It's, uh, there's still an element in this book of women behaving in ways that conform to teenage boy fantasies rather than the way that women actually behave. Two incidents towards the end of this book where Karen, who's, I guess she's in her something like mid-twenties or late-twenties, and 12-year-old Benny has a huge crush on her. And one way or another, Karen and Benny end up sleeping in the same sleeping bag. And Benny has an erection. And, and Karen is, like, reassuring him that it's okay. Don't worry about it. Whereas I th I would like to think in reality a woman would firstly not be in that situation. And secondly, remove herself from it if that happened. And then later on, she's, like, kissing him on the mouth. Which it's not presented as a sexual thing. But that's how Benny takes it. <clears throat> and, um... Just things like that, uh, like the Richard Lehman appearing in his own novel to remind us that this is actually still a Richard Lehman book and women are not, the, not the, the deepest characters in the world in his books. They tend to just behave uh, in ways that adolescent boys like to imagine them behaving. However, you know, those really are the only two flaws I can find to make in this book. I guess another thing I can say is that it starts slowly. It in, uh, the first 50, 60 pages is these two families arriving at the camp. And <clears throat> because Lehman doesn't bother with a description, um, it, it can be a little bit tedious. But on the other hand, I do get why he did that. He wanted to set up the characters. He wanted to introduce us to the family the families and their dynamics. He wanted to give us some backstory on Scott and his deceased wife and where how Karen appeared on the scene. He wants us to get to know the two, I think I would call them the two main characters, 16-year-old Julie on one family and 17-year-old Nick from the other family. And he does a good job by his standards of depicting normal families with normal people who love each other and uh, bicker sometimes but beneath all the bickering there is a, a love for everyone between everyone so good characters firstly and now about the story so the story basically involves these two families going off to the woods they come across these uh, these two <clears throat> characters here this old woman and it calls him here a depraved half beast who is a natural lust she can't control and, but that kind of led me to believe the first time I read it, this was going to be kind of a monster book or a creature feature. It, it implies the son is some kind of uh, deformed mutant thing, but he isn't, as far as I can make out. It's just a, a normal in terms of his physical makeup. He's just a normal man, young man. And I'm not even sure how unnatural his lusts are, because he just lusts after pretty women who he comes across. <clears throat> Obviously, it's unnatural to do what he does to them, but I, don't, I can't say his lusts are that unnatural. So he's, he's just a, their normal uh, mother and son in, ter in terms of, like I said, their physicality. 
It looks like the mother has made a pact with a devil or the devil, which has given her supernatural powers. And she, at the end of the first part of this book, ends up putting a curse on these campers. End of part one. Part two then shifts the action back to Los Angeles, where we see this curse taking effect and what it does to the various people. I really liked that section of the book very much. I love all of this book, but I liked that section especially. I thought it was creative. And I wasn't expecting it. I really thought all of this was going to be set in the woods. But no, he he very wisely mixed it up and shifted the action back. And then in part three, so that the curse takes effect and does all kinds of nasty stuff to them. And then in part three, the grand finale, some of the characters go back to the woods for a final confrontation with the old woman. It's really well structured, this book. Um, it's the best thing about it, I think, is the way that it's it's constructed. So I'm not going to say a great deal more about this because I'm not going to give away any plot spoilers. I re highly recommend this book and for that reason I'm not going to spoil any part of it. Um, my favourite film horror franchise of all time is Friday the 13th. Uh, partly because it's set in the woods and I love the woods for a horror setting. There are so many great 80s slashes set in the woods like uh, Just Before Dawn and Don't Go in the Woods Alone, The Prey. And... For that reason, I was always probably going to like this. I was going to like this if it wasn't awful. And this is a lot better than not awful. This is a really good Richard Lehman novel, and it's I recommend it. So, all right, that's going to do it for Dark Mountain from 1987. I'll be back soon with another video. But until then, thank you for watching this one, and take care of yourselves. Bye for now.